Olio is the world's first neighbour to neighbour food sharing app and we've been lucky enough to get the chance to talk to Tessa Clark about her journey in business so far and what led her to start such an innovative business. During the chat, we get to listen to how Tessa and her co-founder went from the initial idea to product launch, how they're now looking at expanding the product portfolio, how they've actually handled doubters along the way, how important market research has been during this journey, what it's like to be a woman in business, finishing with a few top tips about entrepreneurship and what will help you on your journey. Hi, Tessa. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello. Um, So as you said, I'm Tessa. I'm co-founder and CEO of Olio, which is the world's first neighbour-to-neighbour food sharing app. So food sharing apps. Can you tell us a bit more about why, first of all, like you went into the app market? what What was it about a food sharing app that really caught your eye or really thought that's a great business venture to go down? Well, I think I should start off by saying that I had never imagined that I would be an entrepreneur. It always felt like it was something that other people who perhaps didn't look like me um, did. Um, And I went off and actually after university pursued what could be described as a fairly classic corporate career. And I did that for about 15 years. And it was very clear to me during that time that the world of digital was where the future lay. And so whilst I was working in large corporates, I always made sure that I worked in the digital arm. But the inspiration for Olio uh, took place five and a half years ago now. So I was living in uh, Switzerland, moving back to the UK. And on moving day, the removal men said to me, I had to throw away all of our uneaten food. And I'm a farmer's daughter, so I know how much uh, work goes into producing the food we all eat every day. So I wasn't prepared to do that. Much of the irritation, I set out onto the streets, armed with my food, trying to find someone to share it with. And to cut a long story short, failed miserably. I went back to my apartment, I wasn't to be defeated. And so when the packing men weren't looking, I smuggled the sort of non-perishable food into the bottom of my packing boxes. And that was the sort of metaphorical light bulb moment when I just thought, this is crazy. I shouldn't be having to resort to this. I've worked in digital forever. There's an app for everything. Why isn't there an app where I can share my food? And that sort of seemingly inconsequential moment in my life took my whole life uh, in this very different direction. I think that's why, why we really wanted to speak to you. Tessa, because obviously we heard you at Disney Live and um, we just thought it was a really interesting story and the way that you brought it all together of how you like went from a corporate career to becoming an entrepreneur. And like you said, you, you didn't really set out to do that. It's just what you fell into um, because you saw a gap in the market. So what, what made you want to leave the corporate world? So I think in your talk, you talked about working alongside um James Dyson at some point so what what made you want to leave that kind of world and and become an entrepreneur? Well I think there was two things really so the first thing was that whilst I had a corporate career that looked amazing you know I had a sort of a great CV um, I realized that if I were to die tomorrow I wasn't actually especially proud of what I had achieved And so I was really driven by this sort of this idea of kind of looking back on my deathbed and thinking, will I have been proud of what I've done? And I'd had this sort of growing desire to do something entrepreneurial, probably for about five or six years before I did um, do Olio. And what I found is I would often go to perhaps events like the uh, Disney Live and I would sit in the audience and I'd listen to all these amazing people sharing all these amazing stories about the amazing stuff they were doing. And I was so inspired by their life. And then I'd reflect on my own and realize that I was just profoundly uninspired by myself and what I was doing and that was just really starting to bug me Um, and then sort of what really gave me the push though was was having that experience and identifying a problem Um, and I think that's a really important thing um, to highlight is that during those five years when I thought I wanted to do something entrepreneurial I had sort of beat myself up because I didn't have an idea And I was kind of looking for the idea. And I've now realized retrospectively that that's going about it completely wrong. What you need to look for is not an idea. What you need to look for is a problem that you care deeply and passionately about solving. So I'd had that experience where I'd end up, um, you know, smuggling my food, which was clearly ridiculous. Um, And that had then triggered me to research the problem of food waste. And what I discovered, so very briefly, is that globally a third of all the food we produce each year gets thrown away. 
which is worth over a trillion dollars. 800 million people go to bed hungry every night who could be fed on a quarter of the food that we waste in the Western world. And if it were to be a country, food waste would be the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after the USA and China. And then as we look to the future, we've got another 2.2 billion people joining the planet. We need to increase global food production by 50%. And we have no idea how we're going to achieve it. And then on top of all of that, I discovered that half of all of food waste takes place in the home. So once I'd, sort of, I'd gone through that journey of learning about just this problem, I, it was just so clear to me that it had to be solved. And I thought, and my co-founder Sasha thought that actually an app that connects neighbours to share could make a massive dent in solving the problem of food waste in the home. And that's the final thing that I would um, sort of say was critical to me setting up Olio was that I had a co-founder. So I probably wouldn't have had the courage to launch Olio by myself, but I'd explain this idea of a, of a neighbours neighbour food sharing app to one of my closest friends, Sasha she immediately got it and there's definitely some sort of safety in numbers and we knew that we um, were super sort of compatible and complementary to one another and so all of those factors you know it was the right time in my life with the right problem with the right co-founder that is then what gave me the impetus to bring Olio to life. That That is such an interesting story like it, it, it's brilliant you, you followed you've been in corporate you've been you, I suppose did you feel restricted before I move on? Yes to <laughs> Yes. So I have been reflecting on this sort of quite a lot, actually. Um, and I have realized that I spent quite a lot of time in my corporate career feeling a little bit uncomfortable, if I'm being honest. So I did very well, um, but feeling quite uncomfortable. One, I think, because I was the only woman in predominantly male environments. Um, and so you just sort of operate in a way that wasn't necessarily super comfortable to me. Um, and then second, I was always someone who could see the future I could see what needs to be done and so I would get quite frustrated by a lot of the sort of the bureaucracy and the slow pace of a uh, of a large corporate and so now I sort of reflect back on it it's kind of probably obvious given who I was that I would always be an entrepreneur but it took me 15 years to have the courage and conviction and sufficient sort of self-belief or maybe not even self-belief but I just thought you know F it I'm going to try yeah. it <laughs> got to that point um, but I've had enough like, I'm, yeah I'm exactly yeah. exactly you know when you're, you're at that point where you thought you know what there's got to be an app I'm fed up with this you've got your co-founder um and you you believed it would happen what part did market research play in this did you do any market research or did you have a gut feeling that you know it'd work so a gut feeling is is really powerful and that sort of inner conviction is the thing that will sort of keep you going through a long entrepreneurial journey but it is nothing without the market research to back it up and actually it's the market research that sort of reinforced that gut conviction so as i've explained to you the very first thing we did was that desk research to understand how big is this problem that we think we've identified and so I've, I've walked you through that so that was a very big tick in the box it was very clear from the desk research this was a really big problem the next question though we had to answer was well just because it's a big problem it doesn't mean to say that anyone cares about it yeah. so we need to test and validate whether people care about it so what we did was we created a market research um, survey using a tool um, called survey monkey at the time you know now we would use something like Typeform. And essentially, we just posted it out into lots of local Facebook groups, asking people's opinion about sort of food waste and did they waste food? How do they feel about it? How would they feel about sharing with a neighbor, et cetera? And the critical data coming out of that was firstly, um, that a third of people told us that they were physically pained throwing away good food. And we deliberately used extreme language like that. We didn't want people to just go, yeah, food waste is bad. Because if you are physically pained by something, that's a very clearly extreme problem that you probably want solving. So that was great. One in three people said they were physically pained throwing away good food. Um, and then the other thing was that over half of the users said that they would be prepared to go to a neighbor's house um, to, to pick up free food. So that was, that was fantastic. So we'd identified it was a big problem on paper. We'd identified that it was a problem that people cared about. But that didn't mean to say that people would take the next step in our hypothesis, which is to actually share food with a stranger slash neighbor. And I think a mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make is they jump straight to building an app. 
And building an app is very, very expensive. It takes a long time and also um, it costs a lot to maintain an app. So you should only build an app if you're absolutely convinced that you have a product that the market wants. And so Sasha and I thought, well, how can we test that people will share food with a neighbor without sinking our life savings building an app that no one might want? And so what we did was we came up with this concept of a, a, a proof of concept using WhatsApp. And so we invited 12 of the people who had said that they were physically pained throwing away good food on our survey. They all lived near each other in North London. They didn't know each other. We didn't know them. We reached out to them via email and said, hey, would you take part in this sort of crazy experiment we're going to do for two weeks? We're going to put you on a closed WhatsApp group with people who live near you. And if you have any surplus food, you know, this is the group of people that you can share it with. And so we waited with sort of bated breath for I think at least 24 hours to see, oh my God, is anyone actually gonna share some food? And then boom, um, I think it was like on a Monday morning, someone shared the uh, first item in there and that was so exciting. And then within sort of, I think 23 minutes, one of the other people on the WhatsApp group had requested it. And then over the next two weeks, we saw several kind of neighbor to neighbor shares take place via the WhatsApp group. And then what we did after that um, proof of concept was Sasha and I met with all of those 12 people in coffee shops all over um, North London. Uh, really weird meeting them sort of face to face for the first time. And we asked for their feedback. And they told us three things. They said, one, you absolutely have to build this. Two, it only needs to be slightly better than a WhatsApp group. And three, how can I help? Um, and sort of points two and three were absolutely critical for us because two, it only has to be slightly better than a WhatsApp group is so important because when you're wanting to launch something you think it needs to be perfect it's like you're putting part of yourself out in the world and you feel like it has to be perfect and that is absolutely the wrong thing to do you just need to get a product out as a basic product or what's called an mvp a minimal viable um, product or proposition out into the market as quickly as you can to get feedback and so for example making that real for you prior to that proof of concept we had assumed that we had to launch olio with ratings and reviews, because surely we're sort of connecting neighbors slash strangers to share them. We must have ratings and reviews. Um, but then when we realize it only has to be slightly better than the WhatsApp group, we're like, no, we don't, not for our early adopters. They don't need that. And so we launched without that feature. And it actually took us, I think almost two years post launch until our users told us that ratings and reviews were sufficiently important that that needs to be the next feature that we built. Um, so yeah, so, to as a long-winded way of answering your question um, through evidence though to demonstrate that market research is is absolutely critical and even today you know every single day we are getting feedback from our users and we sort of prioritize our product map uh, in response to user feedback and we sort of balance that with our vision of where we know we want to go and what we need to do so it's that constant sort of balancing act of what your users tell you and then stuff that you know that they don't know that you want to bring into the world. Brilliant. I think that's, I think you made some really good points that would be really valuable to a lot of young people that we, we obviously work with a lot of young people. And I think it's good that you've got that balance between going where you go and you knowing it were right, but also then getting the feedback to reinforce that it were right. And I think that really, really is a good mix of the two. Um, it, it, yeah, it is. And in, in the early stages sort of of a startup, um, I, I think if you can kind of almost imagine sort of two lines that intersect each other, in the early stage of the startup, actually, you, you have virtually no data. And so all you have is your instincts and your gut. And then over time, and so your decision making is very driven by that. But then over time, you get more and more and more data. And so eventually the two kind of intersect and then data becomes the most important thing. And your gut has to take a second place, actually, because yeah. 100,000 people can't be wrong. A million people can't <laughs> be wrong. 10 million people can't be wrong. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good point. I think. Um, do, you, do you struggle with sort of have you had any doubters when it comes to like, I know you've got your data and you've got all that, but. Do you ever find that people sort of try to say, oh, you've got a good career, that even with all this data, all this research, you've done, you've done the tests, people are saying it's great, but did you have anyone like in your ears sort of saying, ah, stay in your corporate job, 
I don't think you should have done this. It, it's nice on side, but it's it's never going to be out. Did, did you ever deal with any of that from maybe family, friends, or just, just people in general? Uh, I'm smiling because, yes, pretty much absolutely everybody <laughs> thought that Sasha and I were completely crazy. Um, we were both on maternity leave at the time, and I think people thought that maybe we'd got sort of baby brains and we needed to <laughs> get back to work quickly because we really were going crazy. Um, so, yes, we... we um, you know, we've had an enormous number of doubters and continue to have doubters, right? Um, but uh, I think sort of the businesses and the things that really end up having a massive impact and sort of changing the world are never obvious at the time. So they're kind of retrospectively obvious, but at the time they might seem sort of quite contra contrarian and quite different. Um, and, and that, I think, is something that you do need to. So you need to listen to people's feedback. You need to look at the data. But whenever you're getting feedback from someone, you always need to sort of recognize that they are giving it on the basis of their subject, subjective opinion and experience. And that might or might not be relevant to you. So, for example, and, and, and too often, you know, in the early days, all you care about is your early adopters. And so what I realized very, very quickly is that actually when I sort of talk to people, um, roughly a third of people, no matter how long I tried to explain to them about earlier and how amazing it is and this and the other, and I just could never convince them. And so I very quickly realized, you know what, I just need to give up. Like, there's no point in me wasting any more time or emotional energy doing that. Just forget about those people. They will get with the program in a few years' time. And then there's this sort of middle bunch who could sort of get it, and they were probably just sort of humoring me a little bit more because perhaps they liked me or respected me. Um, but I could tell they weren't going to sort of necessarily do anything immediately. And then there was actually kind of about one in three people would get it. Um, and so that's the sort of the really important thing is you need to recognize that in the early days, the majority of people will not get it. Um, and if everybody gets it, then it's probably quite concerning because either someone else or lots of other businesses will have already filled that gap in the market, or um, it will just be kind of um, very hard to um, you know, very quickly become a very competitive space. So you need to find your early adopters and listen to them and try and just tune out everybody else. I suppose those early adopters become your fans, don't they, over time? Because they've been with you from the start. So do you still feel like there's something that you get more from them than you do the newer clientele? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, sort of human emotions are contagious. And so, and so when you're um, a founder, you know, for the first sort of, months, years even, certainly if you're a first time founder, you'll feel like a complete imposter, even saying the word founder, even saying the word entrepreneur. I know Sasha and I had that for a very long time. Um, but you then get that sort of positive feedback from people who are really passionate about what you do. And that would give you the confidence and the courage to, to sort of carry on. And, and we take a lot of inspiration from our early users and our, and our early fans. They kind of help us through the dark days and, and the down uh, down bits of the experience. No, that, that's that's fantastic. And I think just touching back on a, on a previous point, when you said about not having to have a perfect product, because I think that's what too many people care about. And I know with, with the business students we teach and even ourselves when we've had a business idea, we don't want to launch it until it's perfect. And then we got to a point where, like you said, it's like, you know what? It doesn't matter. Put it out there and we'll develop it. The market research will yeah. tell us, people will feed back. The market speaks, you know, if people download it, if people buy it, if people give you that positive, then it's probably okay. And then you can improve yeah. it. So I think that's probably an important point and message to it for anyone to take out. It, it, it is critical and it is extremely counterintuitive. Um, you know, so, so you will be constantly thinking just one more thing, just one more improvement, just one more. Yeah. And you've just got to stop that, you know, yeah. so, so perfection is the devil of done or whatever the expression is. Like, yeah. You just need to get something extremely basic out so that you can get real data and real information. Because the problem is that you are sort of a market of one. Uh, you're just one person with all of your sort of biases and this, that, and the other. And the quicker you can get your product into the hands of real people. Now it needs to be your target market. Okay. So it needs to be those early adopters. But the minute you can get it into the hands of those people and start responding to that, that's when you start to get traction. Okay, so in terms of, you, you touched on earlier, like you were in the corporate world and you felt like it was a male-dominated 
um, especially the company you're working with, male dominated, made you feel uncomfortable. And I think um, women in business and, and leadership positions and, and more so the pay gap is a real um, talking point at the minute. But I think just in general, how have you found it being a woman in business? Has it, has it given you any advantage at all in certain scenarios? What disadvantages or, or circumstances, or how have you felt about this disadvantage here? Um, or do you think it actually has made no difference and you could just cut through with the, the noise? Yeah. It's a really interesting question. So I think in my early career, so probably all the way until my early 30s, I did not think that being a woman in business had impacted me in any way, shape or form. I genuinely didn't. Um, I felt like I'd been able to progress my career. I hadn't experienced overt sexism. Um, I didn't think it had impacted me. Once I hit my early 30s, though, and I became sort of, you know, quite senior, um, I realized that actually there were very few sort of women at that level. And I think in many ways, I was often perceived as a threat because I was different. Um, and it, 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 it was sort of increasingly difficult to get things done um, because I do think that women are sort of held in, in business are often held to a different standard than men. But um, I can remember having a really, really sort of um, bit of a mind blowing experience a few years ago where I attended an event and it was the women only and it was about fundraising. And there's a room with you know, the panel was sort of five women. There's probably 100 women in the room. And after, at the end of that session, I reflect on just how comfortable I felt. It just like everything felt natural. I felt at ease. I felt at home. I felt comfortable. And I had this blinding realization that like, oh my God, that's how men feel the whole time. <laughs> and actually, I've spent my whole career feeling slightly uncomfortable, needing to put on a mask, needing to act and behave in a certain way. And, and I was like, wow, okay, actually, and when you're living with just this, I just got used to it that for me sort of progressing in my career required me to feel slightly uncomfortable. And um, so that was sort of quite an eye-opening moment. And then I had another equally eye-opening moment a week ago where I read a blog post and it was um, by someone, by a guy writing about um, six of Silicon Valley's most amazing product managers. And the first one was a woman. I'm like, yay, a female product manager. You know, she was someone at kind of the Apple Mac. And then the second one was a woman. I'm like, oh my God, two female product managers. That's amazing. And then the third one was a woman. I'm like, okay, the last three are going to be guys now. And then the fourth one was a woman. The fifth one was a woman. I was like, okay. And then I sort of messaged someone on my team and I said, wow, who's, who's also female, who's a female product manager. And I said, wow, this is how men feel the whole time. Like they're used to seeing lists that are just all guys or panels that are all guys. And I've literally never read a blog post in my life that has called out that wasn't specifically about women in tech or women in product. It was just saying, here is excellence in product. They just happen to be um, six women. So um, I, I think thankfully kind of overt sexism, you know, it's day is hopefully over. It's not totally over. I know, you know, the Me Too movement is evidence enough of that. But I think that actually what is a bigger challenge for a lot of women and people of color um, and people who are from different socioeconomic backgrounds is that we don't have yet a truly inclusive um, business environment and where I get um, so I think that just sort of that structural element um, is, is a challenge uh, for people from a diverse background when it comes to the startup world um, I'm afraid I found myself getting really quite frustrated um, and I have felt that being female has been um, to my detriment in one area only, and that's in fundraising. So in terms of running a business, recruiting a team, you know, delivering traction, all that kind of stuff, I think being female has only been an asset. But in fundraising, it's been challenging because um, last year in venture capital, only 1% went to female founders. 89% went to male founders and the Delta went to mixed teams. And so that's really off-putting odds when you're going out to fundraise. And the reason why I get so angry about it is I think the reason for this is because what I call the gatekeepers of capital, 
So the people who are taking the decision, the investors, are not a diverse group of people. And so they tend to invest in non-diverse founders. And yet when I look at the founders who are bringing to life the businesses that need to exist, who are solving the world's biggest problems, they are such an incredibly diverse group of people. And so for too long, I think venture capital has backed the 1% and has overlooked the 99%. And yet the 99% are the ones who are quite literally saving the world. Um, but I think the good news is that sort of collectively, I think the industry is starting to wake up to that. And there are lots of diversity initiatives underway. So hopefully it will be changing rapidly. The, the eye-opening part for me, what you said in that is that you felt like, wow, this is what men must feel like all the time. Um, and I've never really thought about that, to be honest with you. Like, I've never thought like, yeah, I am, I am, especially being a white male, I am definitely in, in and around that um, a lot. And I think it's a really good insight into like, just the mindset. But I like how you said it's never, you felt like it never bothered you and you didn't feel like it impacted you. Um, what what what's your goal with Olio overall? So when when will you look back and sort of think, yeah, we've really done what we set out to achieve? Well, we have um, an enormous goal for Olio. It's kind of terrifying to say it out loud, but I do because what what gets said gets done. Um, so our goal is to have a billion people using Olio within the next ten years, uh, and the reason for that is very simple. If humanity wants to stand any chance whatsoever of mitigating the worst effects of the climate crisis, then we have got to stop throwing away our food and stop sort of consuming all of these sort of non-food other household items that we do. So buying brand new, using it for 5% of its life and tipping it in the bin uh, and, and sort of buying some more again. And so our sort of vision of a world is one where everybody is connected with their immediate community and we are sharing the world, world's most precious resources, whether it be food or non-food items. Because on the non-food piece, so just to clarify on that, Olio has a non-food section in the app where people are able to give away their unwanted toiletries or cleaning products or kitchen appliances, books, clothes, toys, etc. And that's super important. It's just as important as the food aspect of what we do because the average uh, American home, for example, has 300,000 things in it. And the average British home will not be far behind that. And the problem is that is the world's precious resources trapped in your home that is not being used. And the reason why that cannot continue uh, is best exemplified by this very simple concept called Earth Overshoot Day. And so that's the day in the year in which humanity has used all the resources that the Earth can replenish in a year. And back in the late 60s, when it was first measured, Earth Overshoot Day was the 31st of December. So it meant that humanity used in a year what the Earth could replenish in a year, happy days. Fast forward to last year, Earth Overshoot Day was the 29th of July. And so what that means is that every single thing that every single one of us, seven and a half billion people consumed after the 29th of July last year was net net depletive to the planet. And so it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that seven and a half billion people consuming in that way, rapidly rising to 10, cannot continue. We live on a world that is made up of finite resources. And so that's why we want to sort of move from the current model where we extract resources, use them for 5% of their life, toss them into landfill and start over, to a much more circular sharing economy where actually uh, resources are being used again and again and again and again in amongst our local communities in the way by the way that humanity has always shared apart from in the last kind of 50 years or so when we've gone so far um, off piste you make so many valid points and what you got me thinking there was at the minute you focused on food waste but you mentioned so over so many other areas and and important categories that are are important for the earth and people today yeah is there, is there any scope where, where are your plans long term could you go into into other markets is it, is it just always going yep. to be food? so um we've started off in food we've now got a non-food section which is actually growing um extremely fast right now and then later on this year we're going to be adding two new sections so one called so the, the sort of uh, the food and non-food section is all about giving stuff away for free to your neighbors stuff you just 
don't want you want it out of the house but you don't want it to go to waste we're going to be introducing a new section um, in the app this autumn called borrow which will be connecting neighbors so that they can lend and borrow items to one another like a drill like a fancy dress outfit for your kid like a popcorn maker like a cat carrier sort of all those things that you only need to use maybe once maybe twice a year it doesn't make sense for every household on the street to have one of those stuffed in their house somewhere we should be connected with each other to lend and borrow things to one another and then another new section that we're also going to be experimenting with later in this year is called made and that will be where we connect neighbors to sell homemade food and handmade crafts to one another because we think that um, in particular as a result of covid we're sort of we're becoming a nation of makers we're kind of reconnecting with many of those um traditional pastimes i guess if you like uh and we're increasingly wanting to actually isn't it lovely to buy some jam that's been homemade by someone three doors down from you know something that was grown organically in their garden rather than buy a horrible soulless jar of jam from a supermarket you know that's full of god knows what um so yes uh, we will continue to sort of develop the olio proposition but always very clearly anchored around our usps um which is sort of hyper local it's always about connecting you with your immediate neighbors and it's always about enabling people to lead a planet friendly life so it's all about kind of sustainable living so essentially you're keeping those values that have been at the heart of why you set yeah. up in the first place what you're yeah. diversifying so you can effectively reach more people correct help more people and grow as a business exactly we want to make olio sort of more useful to more people and if it's more useful to more people it'll be more top of mind um and it will be used more often which will in the end encourage more food sharing which is our ultimate goal um as an organization that's why we exist is to solve the problem of food waste in the home but we think that we've got to provide a you know make the app more useful to more people and that will end up in more food being shared so by, by di diversifying i suppose your product range if you like yep. ultimately that might drive you to have more comp uh, customers which then yep. will come back into the original product portfolio. I love that. Spot on. Yeah, that, that's exactly the plan. So watch this space. Let's see how it uh, unfolds. But that's the plan. Really like that. Just before we go on, the recording's only got, to, we've only got one more question, but it's a really important go. one about um, <laughs> like on the and advice to shoot. We've only got two minutes left on the recording. So could so I just... I'll keep it, I'll keep it fast. Okay, yeah, go for it then. Yeah. Um... So advice for entrepreneurs. Or business, um, young people wanting to potentially start a business? Yeah, so I, a couple of things. So first of all, there is no shortage of enormous existential problems facing humanity today. Time is running out. They need to be solved. And the people who are going to solve these things are entrepreneurs. So my first piece of advice is go find a problem that you are passionate about solving, whether it be the climate or healthcare or inequality um, or education, go find your problem. Second thing, read uh, a book called The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. It's an absolute Bible in terms of how to um, get a product into market. Third thing, read a book called The Mom Test um, by a guy, I think it's called Rob Fitzpatrick. That's all about how to do um, really high quality market research about your idea in the early days. And then uh, the fourth thing I'd say is see if you can validate your idea by utilizing an existing platform. Don't spend all your money building an app um, right off the bat. And then the fifth thing is enjoy and have fun. You know, stay curious on the journey, learn as much as you can from other people, reach out to other um, founders and entrepreneurs, and you will find it to be the most fulfilling thing that you can possibly do with your life. Brilliant. Boom, Absolutely we got brilliant. there with a minute to spare. Got it, yeah, easy. <laughs>